today I want to share further techniques like following up uh, last week's uh, last not last week's last uh, session to like um uh so you like a lot of different approaches that I take with baselines and techniques that uh, help me achieve uh, you know a result that uh, I personally like okay so like um we're going to see like, some software and also if we have time I would like to show some hardware as well because usually I do like to work with a combination of things and today like we saw some projects the other day today I want to focus a little bit more on the methodologies and the way of thinking like of uh, between processing and actually programming that I find beneficial so like I put together like this little project because I want to show a few techniques here for you so like let's start with that let me share my sound so like uh, zoom and share also uh, 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 stereo okay great so can you all hear all right awesome yeah I want to also like since we're going to talk about baselines obviously I want to talk a little bit uh, inside the session for the relationship with the kick I want to talk a little bit about like this kind of uh, tuning kick uh, kind of uh, huge subject that uh, apparently like a million people have a million different opinions I'll tell you my opinion after hearing like and uh, a million opinions on working with kicks like for 20 years so like it's it's interesting like when we work work with kicks and uh, if we need to tune them, how we need to tune them, how it works with the baseline and all that. So I want to start like, first of all, by the programming of this uh, baseline, which is actually quite simple. As we saw last time, I really, really like to work with uh, some of the Ableton or Logica devices. I don't always need to get like a third party plugin. And uh, again, that's something I see with a lot of students opening like, you know, Serum or like uh, Diva or Anna. Yes, brilliant scenes, all of those really heavy third parties. But do not underestimate the tools you have in your DAW. They're extremely powerful and you can get some amazing results just using those. You will be surprised how many people I know releasing on massive labels, friend of mine, just releasing like just using like Ableton or Logic stock plugins. So like uh, don't underestimate like the powerful tools that you have in your DAW. So like in here, this initial baseline that I want us to look at and the first technique is this one. So this initial baseline here is practically through FM synthesis, but uh, let's see what's going on. So let me, let me duplicate the track, but this project has been for some reason really temperamental and like uh, crossing. I don't know why, just uh, today it, it crossed a few times. Hopefully it's not gonna cross anymore. So let's copy the channel so we don't ruin it. So I'm gonna deactivate like the operators. So first one, simple sine wave. And now second one, have it tuned like on three, three times the frequency of the operator one essentially this means. And this one on four, four times of operator one. Now, the important thing when you're doing bass lines and uh, bass sounds using FM. In this case, it's really a combination of additive and FM. But uh, in this case, what is the most important thing for those of you that are familiar with FM and for those of you that you are not, because just with a few simple controls, obviously go and learn FM or like take our sound design class if you have it in the future. But if you are not familiar with FM, in this case here, the more obviously I raise the amplification of operator two, which affects the frequency of operator one, and we have frequency modulation and we get the extra harmonics and so on, but we're not gonna do like FM now. I will take this as a given. And uh, this one here, it's all about also the envelopes, how the amplification of the other operators would move in time. For example, the second one here, you see, if I change the envelope something shorter, I lose the whole sound. The whole sound is here. This is actually staying up. There's a stain, it's pretty significant. I want to show you also even small movements on the envelopes because do not underestimate the guys simple additive and the fem, especially the operator of Ableton. It's so beautiful, it's simple to use. This has been used like uh, and uh, in so many songs you wouldn't imagine. There's a good reason why so many people are using it for like uh, sub bass, acid lines, uh, and so on. It's a really powerful tool, simple to use. It sounds fantastically. So like here. 
The envelope is extremely important to get it right. And the third envelope is really snappy. If you see this one, it, it can destroy the sound completely. So like, what I would say for all those like sub bassy like uh, sounds, when you are programming like your FM here, pay a lot of attention, a part of course, like from uh, like the tuning of it, which is like three means three times the frequency of oscillator of operator one. You can have it fixed on other FM, but again, not FM like uh, theory today in depth because I have to take it as a given to show you a lot about bass lines. And the envelopes, the envelopes are of extreme importance. I know also like in FM, when you're designing bass lines, you do have like the ability to, in modern kind of synthesizers, not just use like, uh, you know, sine waves, but you could use any wave. I would advise, however, if you were to start using FM now and using it for your like bass lines, keep it like to how it was traditionally used on DX7 and DX1. Keep it with sine waves. Start understand really, really well how it sounds with sine waves. Understand really well how to manipulate the synthesizer with just sine waves. And later, if you feel like what you really need to add like more waveforms in there, like uh, fantastic, do it. But start by the way this was traditionally being used on DX7. I think like this will give you a much deeper understanding of FM. What else is happening here? So the interesting thing here is that I have actually changed the algorithm. So. You see, the first algorithm, the default one, was this one, and it sounds like that, which is a bit awful. So practically, this says what is a carrier, what is a modulator. And in this case, it is important to explore different avenues, because this will completely change the way your bass sounds. In this case, we have like, uh, I actually thought we had that, so this is not uh, additive, and FM is purely FM. So essentially, in the first example, you have like the fourth operator, which is not being used here, modulating the third, the third modulating the second, the second modulating the first. In this case, if this happens, obviously we do not get the sound we want. In the one we are actually using, this is let's ignore the first one because it's being unused. This says that actually operator two and three, they are not having this relationship between themselves, the third modulating the second and then the first. But here, they both will modulate operator one. So also extremely important to experiment with the algorithm and what algorithm type you want to get the sounds you like. Another little tip, which I'm, we did it last time. I'm not going to do it for this sound because I think it's pretty punchy. I like it as it is. But another tip that we saw last time and, and something that works massively with bass lines is pitch envelope and have like a quick pitch coming like from higher up down. So like, that's like something fast. So zero. So tick, tack, 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 tack. So you get this like a tick, 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 nice little attack. This sound doesn't need it. That's why like, I'm not gonna do it for this sound. But for other sounds, if you want a little bit more percussive attack on your bass, always like a pitch envelope that starts like from a bit higher up and comes down with a quite short decay really. It's uh, usually the way to go. And it gives us always this like, nice percussive attack if the sound needs it. Now in this case, we have that. So like, uh, haven't really done anything else. This is just the result of uh, the way the operators work. The filter, it's not really doing anything. So it's just taking away some harsh, uh, like uh, harmonics in the very, very high up of the spectrum, but uh, it's not really being used here. And again, one thing I want you to remember when you are using FM, like for any kind of sound, is that if you want to use it traditionally and really understand it, you don't have to use a filter. Essentially by changing the amplification of the operators, you could be practically taking away the harmonics because as, David and other people who have done sound design with me might remember the extra harmonics are actually being produced when you amplify the other operators. So you could do that traditionally and just like uh, take the amplification down. But since you have the option to have a filter, you know, if you're being a bit lazy and you want to get it immediately, why not? It's going to be different filtering though. That's another thing you need to remember with all that. It's different filtering that you will essentially get if you reduce the amplification and you reduce the harmonics or if you actually use a traditional 
filter like this, low pass, like that. It's going to be a different way of filtering. And this affects a lot the sounds and the bass, of course, if the sound that we're talking about is bass. Now that we have that, I want to show you one of my favorite techniques for getting like um, my bass to have like some real nice buzz. It. So we have that here now. So I have bounce touch. And we have that here. By the way, these little kinds of uh, tick tick is coming from a river I have set up. And you shouldn't be afraid to use river or bass if it works. In this case, like I'm obviously reducing it here. And I would possibly like reduce the lows a little bit more when I was mixing it. But I'm sure like most of you might already know that a reverb on bass, especially on the mid and high frequency of the bass, could be well useful. Obviously, later I could clean up the low end. In this case, it's not really doing anything like negative, and I have like some processing going through my returns, which kind of cleans the bottom end like on the reverbs. What I want to do here though is like now that we have this bounce. Okay. We have that. Uh, we're gonna like uh, mute all of those so we do it together. The one problem like I have uh, many, many times, and uh, it bothers me a lot, is um, I want to hear on my bass lines the distortion, the saturation that I'm adding, but just the distortion, the saturation. I find like tons of times when you're adding like a distortion or saturation, and then I'm doing dry wet, I still hear the original signal. Even if you go full wet, practically, the original signal is still in there, especially on distortion saturation that is working with the original signal and adding harmonics to it. You still hear kind of the original signal, and I'm not always entirely sure what exactly the distortion saturation I'm using is doing. Plus, I usually might want to have my distortion and saturation on its own, so I can practically introduce it more or less throughout the track and also create, use it creatively. But how can I get the just distortion or saturation here only that? So I'll show you like a very interesting little trick. So you have that here, and it's um, it's an old trick, but it works. So I'm gonna create a, let's delete everything. Oop, not the actual mu music. Let's delete all the effects, nothing at all. There is a possibility that zoom latency could affect that, hopefully it won't. But uh, let's see. So all we want is to get that and copy it down. So now we have practically just duplicated the signal. Nothing more than that. So what I like to do is I want to bring any plugin. doesn't matter if you're Logic or Ableton. Just bring like uh, it's like the same plugin uh, on uh, Logic Gain plugin that you can just invert the phase. By inverting the phase, what's happening now is you hear nothing. Uh, let's get rid of the reverb. You hear nothing. Because obviously we have exactly the same thing and we have inverted the face. Everything goes away. So what I'd like to do now is bring like my saturation that I want on the other channel. Not on the one with the utility. That's because of like plugin uh, latencies on the other channel. And now, I only hear the distortion. I hear purely what my distortion is doing. I'm not hearing anything else. So I can really, really, really hear exactly the character of my plugin. So with this way now, I can feel very safe about what I'm adding to the sound. So let's say I like that. Actually, do. By the way, guys, Kus Audio, they are amazing. I mean, like, the thing sounds insane. The stuff from these guys, they're very, very good. So let's say, well, I like that. Let's say we like that. All I'm gonna do now is create a new channel and resample it. Okay. Sorry, it's the zoom window in my face. I can't press record. So now what has happened, essentially, is that I have just the sound of this plugin here. 
I can now get rid of the utility. I can get rid of that guy. And now this is like base. This is base distortion. And you see the beauty of it here now. Now I can really blend it the way I want. And I have it on its own, purely the sound of that. And the great trick that you can do like on your tracks in general is have this kind of distortion being introduced more or less in different sections. This can really, really, really enhance sections and give your bass lines the kind of uh, subconscious like uh, thoughts that they are evolving if they are musically not evolving. It makes the listener feel that let's say, the bass line always like evolves in a meaningful way. It keeps them interested. So like distortion that actually meaningfully comes in and out. For me, it's like one of my tricks that really, really keeps things, you know, interesting in the track. It gives me another tool to make some sections sound bigger. And then, of course, here. That makes a huge difference, by the way. If I was now... I'll tell you now another mistake that many people do when processing bass. And uh, it's quite common and easy to make this mistake. One mistake that you can easily do is use the wrong type of uh, equalizer. And uh, sorry, Ableton. I, I also use Ableton quite a lot, but uh, the Ableton EQ is actually not great, I'll put it like that, for important jobs. So I wouldn't be using, if I was to now work between this uh, bass and the bass distortion and I wanted to reduce the low end of the distortion to sit well with the bass which actually works really well as it is right now so like I wouldn't worry too much but if I wanted to examine that when I was doing like my final processing it is extremely important a to use a better uh, EQ and uh, if you want a fast explanation for that, it's because like of the phasing that can occur on the crossover frequencies when you are cutting anything. So some equalizers can handle that much better than others. And I don't know if many of you have seen there is a mode in many equalizers that's called linear phase equalizer. It might actually be, a, you know, I thought hopefully none of you is using linear phases on everything because that would be a very bad idea. Linear phase equalizers, they actually, through like their algorithms and the way they are programmed, eliminate phase problems and phase distortion on the crossover frequencies. However, the sacrifice you make for that is sometimes they can actually affect the transients in a negative way. So you need to remember that linear phase, you might eliminate um, the phase distortion and the phase issues, but it might be affecting your transients a little bit. So you use wisely. For example, though, for something like that, that I might want to get rid of some of my base from one element and make them sit because think of this is a very very sensitive process you have like a whole base spectrum another base spectrum and you want to really really fit them so they work well together in the low end so when we're starting moving that like high pass filter essentially what we're doing down there is very very sensitive so for this purpose i would always try to experiment with a linear phase first of all so and on the fab filter the natural phase sounds pretty good as well but linear phase will be like one of the things that lately I enjoy using for this process. Now we'll start from very low. a little crazy if I wanted to I could do like uh, on the sides now that's now a bit creative but I kind of like sometimes in my distortion I try different techniques but one thing which is quite an easy and fast, fast thing to check is like I could add a little bit of mids like more to the distortion
Ole Seibi. as a first step with that so like linear phase for like uh, when you're working with uh, low end uh, elements it's quite a good solution if you see that it's sacrificing a bit of the transient the transient there is very important natural phase there also works quite well uh, okay very pleased with that now second thing that is very important let's get this stuff together so let's put them together in one thing let's say base and now let's go to the kick here So like um, something very important about tuning kicks. So what is the kick here? Let's uh, do the kick together. So kick. Great. So this kick here is made from the following. Low ni 909. The 909 in this case, it's been transposed down by six. But I will tell you something. The way I actually use uh, tuning on my kick drums is not anymore necessarily thinking about, like, where is the root. I'm not necessarily thinking it like that. I don't think, like, this is usually my train of thought when I'm doing it. And uh, sometimes it can work. I'm not saying it can't work. But the problem is sometimes that if you are thinking with, okay, I have to put it on the root, practically... It can either start classing with the bass if you have on the same octave, massively it will. And uh, secondly, it might have sounded really good in the first place. As I keep saying, like on my lectures, is that uh, if you have like if you go to a gig and you have a drummer, the drummer is are they tuning like uh, the kick drum for every song on the gig? Is every song though on the same key? So like practically, you know, it is now. This is a big kind of conversation. I'll tell you like what I have come to think after like years of using that. I personally, first of all, use my ears as much as it sounds cliche. And the second thing I actually do, I am thinking more in terms of where this sits on my, on my slack, on, a, on my mix. So I'm thinking more about like placing it in the mix in terms of where everything belongs together. So if this is there and like my bass here is doing the bass is here and this one I have tuned it I have tuned it on the very very same frequency so this here could be like uh, working well because this is now you know as you can see tuned to the to the root however in this case they might actually have the issue of classing a little bit because they're playing exactly on the same octave and on the same frequency they are on the traditional kind of thing that uh, sometimes it really works, tuned on the same, like, uh, tuned on uh, the root. But potentially here, I could really examine to go higher as well. And see, like, at... and if my, if this is there, and so, like, if this is there, and that is also there, then I could examine and see. playing there so funnily enough in this particular song to be honest it does work to be honest so in this particular song that tune it like on the actual root it works on this particular song on other songs however don't be so connected with it has to be on the root. Think like that if it's not working on the root, think about, A, does it sound okay the way you have it without tuning it at all? It's It sounds stupid, but it actually is a really good idea. And also, that is massively important. And please take my advice on that. 
if you find some really good kicks that you really enjoy and you know they work really well, you play them out, make a little folder of those kicks and work with the same kicks for a long time, first of all. It's, it's important advice. Second of all, there's one of one of the hardest and worst things I experience like with clients and people I produce for and myself is if I have to change the kick later in the track. The best thing you can do is start with the right kick and ride around that. And you don't change it. So like if you tuning it is fine, but changing the actual kick drum later in the production can be an absolute nightmare. So my idea is generally start from the right kick, find kick drums, record kick drums, any way you're doing them that you really like and work with those. And if you're using a kick drum like from the beginning that you like and it works with the bass from the get-go, you're not going to need to start going and tuning. You are introducing some artifacts when you're not tuning in general. And make sure, for the love of God, you don't have warp on when you are tuning. Warp with beats would be fine because beats would recu- would actually preserve the transients. Complex and anything else, you will be changing the transients completely. So either no warp or warp and beats, but still you might get some artifacts. Ideally, I would say start with a kick that doesn't need a lot of tuning. If you're going to tune it, you use one of those methods. Don't necessarily think it needs to be on the route. No, I know many people on YouTube say lots of absolute truths, which I think, which I also think it's, it's quite stupid with music for people to have any absolute truths. But it's a good idea to try it. If it works, good. If it doesn't work, think of it as a sound design. Think of it as a sound design tool that it will sit in a place and fill the spectrum. If this doesn't work like on the route. So that's like a few things about that. This works well on the route, however. So we're going to keep it there. In this one, and another thing which is very important here, I have like a little click on this kick. Everything is very distorted. Distortion, by the way, on bass lines, kick drums, low end in general is your friend. Massively is your friend. It's like one of the most, most, most important things, distortion. Some of my favorite distortion, Decapitator. Then you have like uh, the one we used here, the TWK, what's it called? TW, TWK. I think it's TWK, which is kind of, uh, uh, it's supposed to be like an old 70s uh, tube uh, kind of uh, distortion thing. It sounds really, really good. And then like from the UAD, the Vertigo VCM3. And from Fab Filter, the Saturn, that will be like. And the Ableton Saturator is amazing, and the Logic plugins are amazing. But all of those things are quite fantastic. Uh, Bryce, it's uh, the Radiator. I have to be honest, I know many people that use it on bass. I've tried to use it on bass. I, I haven't got haven't got the result that I liked. It's very subjective, like that. Many people do like it for bass. I haven't enjoyed it much on bass. I use the radiator a lot on guitars, and I love it on guitars and some like lead synths. I haven't made it sound good on bass until now. Probably because I usually go back to the ones that I like. Again, though, this is very subjective. If you like it, you like it. You know, it's, uh, there's no right or wrong. However, the technique like of having uh, the bass, uh, the distortion of the bass separately is a massive, massive, massive help. And for me, again, I can hear exactly what it's doing, which I don't have it here. Another thing that you always need to pay attention to and understand is the phase between the bass and your kick drum. And there are a million ways to do it. But I think one of the simplest ways that you can uh, think of it is using like the delay of the whole channel. So if you want to visualize it as well and see it, let's save and try that. So, uh, uh, uh. That's absolutely one of my other absolute favorite plugins. Yes, it's 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 mine. Why do I need to log in every time? Mm. Yes, transfer. Thank you. I'm not sure why it asks me every time to transfer my own plugin. Anyway, so what is lovely about that is that um, I'll show you how I use that. So this is like bass now. And do we put on bass? Correct. We're gonna put one instance on the kick. Okay, kick. So this is going to be kick. And we're going to put one instance on the master. I could put like after my compression just to see 
how things sound after compression. The great thing here is that this suddenly now combines all of those. And this is like combination. And let's paint them differently. This is going to be pink. This is going to be, I don't know. Well, I should go. Uh, I should go co hot color, cold color, hot color. Just like make it look nice. Okay. So. plugin latency so and this is so that's because um, oh, okay no that's fine great let me just like make this precise so let's do that great so now without base Now we see the kick here, we see the bass up there, and then in the end we see the result. I have like muted that, so like if we put now the bass, and I can see in a lot of detail how my transients behave here. So I can see very easily, but if let's say you were to move your kick, so look at that, this is the higher part of the kick. It's a bit of, okay, higher part of the kick. Let's hear this part of the kick. If I change the delay of the channel by two, if you look at that, it's really interesting. It actually does that. And the moment like I go to, do you see that? Do you see how much of a huge difference it makes in the transit here? Go back to zero. Do you see what I mean? The change is here like of tiny, tiny things between like the delay of channels. This is this is making a huge difference. So like even and let's change that. Look at like this big nice trans in the beginning disappearing. And now you have like this much more boring kind of and with a tiny bit like on the high of the kick, is this, this this little thing there that you get, this is a pure result of the phase. And instead of trying just, you know, it's great to use like the cool saturation, distortion, and all the cool tools. And by all means, we should. But do not underestimate the important things like that and the basics that many times we forget. What is the most important thing here is how these things uh, work together before you do any side chain and before you do any of that. I want to make sure the phase works correctly, that these two elements coexist as well as they can, and experiment with this. And obviously experiment with that not only on bass and kick and low ends, experiment with that on your high end or your highs, hats, these little things like on the way you move. Uh, by the way, it's go not going to sound like a delay uh, up to 15 milliseconds. Different books have different definitions, but from 0 to 15 to 20, milliseconds our brain perceives it as the same sound so as long as you are moving like the channel a little bit up to there it's not going to sound like it's an actual delay the way we perceive the effect it's only going to be affecting the phase of the sound and how it sits with the rest of the mix so very very big tip and if you want to visualize it like there are many oscill oscilloscopes i like that because you know you can combine like different things in there and uh, yeah you can get some like cool results rather fast so like uh i think this is quite fantastic it's called the oscillos uh, megascope this one now another thing that i want us to see and for us to think about to think about a lot so like it's um close that so I'm gonna, i saved it so let's save a new version uh six and i want to open like this channel uh this is not gonna work though because this project have disliked us very much today. So it fine, it's fine, it doesn't open. We can recreate it in a second. It's not a problem. Yeah, it's not gonna open is that's fine. We do not, we do not mind. We're gonna open what we had before. 
Yeah, no, don't do it. We're going to recreate it. I think another thing like that I wanted to see today with you, and this uh, massively, massively important, is uh, understanding like uh, the little things about expressiveness in bass lines. Because apart from all the techniques we saw like for uh, the distortions, like multiple ways of uh, side chaining, uh, programming them, taking them with Melodyne from other songs and obviously changing them ourselves. It is also important to understand like the little bit, uh, the huge difference a very, very small thing uh, can do. So if we were to take now a thing that we all love and use, as it sounds. Essentially, this kind of thing would be fantastic for us to understand the small things, how important they can be here. So if we were to program like a little bass here, so let's do... Okay, so like uh, if we were to do that, let's put also a kick drum, just for us to have some context. Uh, anything really will do. So 606, they're ma made for each other. So that's for the 606 here. So since most of you like, like Acid Sounds, hopefully, at least the ones that were my students, I remember you like Acid Sounds. Have you ever like sat down and thought like, you know, is this fine? Is this fine? How does this kick sound? So it's my zoom. Okay, that will do. That's fine. So since we have that and it's working there, uh, 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 that's okay. Let's want to hear it a bit more. All right. So let's write a little bit of a bass line. By the way, if you're going to use acid sounds, you need to remember something. You can make acid sounds the operator. You can make acid sounds with lots of things. However, the reason why the 303 is quite complicated to recreate in full and these bass lines on um, software or like hardware emulations is about the little things that uh, the circuit is doing, which are not as simple as the sound. For example, one thing you should know about the 303, and if you were to look at it and listen to it, is that the actual envelope, theoretically, when you are here, if I go like, and by the way, ABL3 is best software emulation of uh, ACID that there is by far. If you were to put like a little note here, and it's interesting to see that, so, okay. Okay, great. Fantastic. So, if you have like an acid line here, that is doing that, and when you're programming them in general, acid lines, you should remember something about the character of the original 303. The character of the original 303, the way the envelope was down, the envelope is never down. The original 303, which carries on the emulations, is practically even when the envelope is at zero, it's not really at zero. And you can see that. There is still movement there. So there is always this is open, because otherwise, This would be doing, you know, nothing, but does a little bit. The decay practically here, all it does, and if we open like the note a little bit more to see it, the decay is affecting only the filter envelope, not the amplitude envelope. This is affecting only the filter envelope, not the amplitude envelope. So let's put that back in zero. Get it. Zero, zero, zero. Another thing which is very important for the 303 is do you see that all these things do nothing now? No one paid attention to say why do they do nothing? Why do these things do nothing? Anyone like who works with acid might have an idea why these things work do nothing right now? Did you put the distortion and drive down? No, it's not there. No, it's the accent. 
one thing you should know for three of phrase is it's funny like we work with three of phrase but I actually have sat down like a few years back and read how the circuit works. It's very interesting. The moment on the actual 303 you write on the on the box there, you press accent, it ignores the decay. The decay will be like it's all the way closed. And on Ableton, the decay, like the velocity, when it goes above 100, this will be perceived as an accent on the 303. So the moment that you're going to be writing an accent in there, this will be ignoring that. This immediately becomes like a very, very fast envelope, like that opens and closes, like the smallest decay. You see, like. It completely changes it because. It's the, moment. the moment I go above 100. This is where it perceives an accent. And if you're using three of three, this is one of your biggest weapons when you are actually programming baselines. Having nodes below 100 and after, under, like above 100. And if you're using the ABL or other emulations or your emulations, if you are not using them inside the sequencer, they have this crossover point of accents. And as long as you know which is the crossover, the crossover and let's, 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 pack, let's do something with that. Let's write a little simple baseline. Uh, uh, also, if you are going to use something like even the Roland is good as well, or like the ABL, remember that like even if you can export the MIDI from all this, it's not going to be exactly the same sometimes with if you were actually programming it inside the sequencer. So like, uh, let's get rid of uh, that. Go here. Okay, let's just go like the traditional step here. And let's write so like what G, uh, E, I mean like... G, E, B, whatever, or okay, and uh, high G or E B. Let's do E B. Uh, uh, e and so we do that. Could do, but I could do that E, something like which E, and this could be B. We can try it. Uh, B. Okay, done. Okay, let's make this H. That's pretty good. What if this was G? Okay. I like it. Hmm. Right, the boss is both are good. Let's say you have that. So, if we were to actually see that, and if I was to bring this now and just record that, so to record, I have to go enable, uh, uh, activate, so like uh, 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 MIDI output, yep. So you can record the actual output of that. So MIDI from ABL, so because I want you to see what's happening here. So like... Wait. Okay, fantastic. So this right now, they are all the same like kind of length. They are all nice and boring. The moment we start doing that now, Even let's see how this sounds. This looks like Midwest.
So what this shows us like directly in here is between the two, if I was to bring now this and play them. So let's go back here, let's get rid of the... No. So one big mistake I see from many people when you're programming bass is like, and I talked about last time the point of the rhythm, but before the plugins, guys, before everything, the important thing is, and I can't stress that enough, you need to remember like, that, you know, bass lines back in the band's days, there was a guy playing the bass, there was expressiveness, there was movement. We need to remember, not all bass lines need crazy movement. There are some bass lines, synth wavy bass lines and other things that are just like more static and they do something specific. But you need to bear in mind, like, how can I get expressiveness in my, ba in my bass line if you need to? If it is a genre and many genres need expressiveness, all genres need expressiveness in some way. Now, the way this is going to be expressed is different. But uh, in most genres, bass lines do need to have like some expressiveness. And you need to think, depending on the genre, how you're going to infuse that. In some genres, for example, you have like these nice little pitch, like pitch bends. Here you can do that, obviously, with a glide between notes. You have like uh, the accent, by the way, it's a very, very unique 303 thing. And you should remember that in general in the future, that it's not just like volume. It is extra volume as well, the accent on a 303, because of the way it hits the circuits uh, back uh, as a feedback thing inside the actual box of the 303. But also, it actually distorts the filter. It gets a decay to minimum. So it adds a very, very particular, different expressive uh, movement to the pattern. And you can see that. But... This are the same notes. The only difference these two have is note lengths and the difference between if I go down here, you see 99, as we said, 100, it becomes accented. Accents, no accents. And this is what gets you here. And if we had now, we start having like this kind of king bass lines. But uh, what is important here, and what is the advanced actual bit, is that you need to spend time that you figure out which notes should be a bit longer, which should be a bit shorter. So like in the here also, in a 303, and the 303 is a good example because as you may might know, the 303 initially came out as trying to be replacing the bass player. If someone didn't have a bass player and they could play very bad for that job, awful for that job. It became really, really good for other jobs that like some people took it and made some amazing stuff with it. It, it didn't replace bass players, that's for sure. Like... um However, because it was trying to replace the bass player, it's a great example of sing expressiveness because it tries to emulate these like uh, glides and these different things. And it gives us a lot of insight in terms of like different things that we can do. So like if you were to just one note overlaps the other, then you have this glide. If this goes high, very, very different. This versus that, versus that. So you can do some absolutely mad, mad things with this. And I'll show you another way to sequence like a bass, which I have thought uh, and I'm using that recently. And um, it's really, really interesting. So let's use that guy here, still the ABL. And what I'm, it could be any synthesizer. And the one thing that I find like with lots of people that are not musicians is that they might have a difficult time to get some very complex and interesting timings in the bass lines, the synth lines. And uh, it is difficult to actually program it in the piano roll a lot of the time. So there is a tool that I have found absolutely fantastic. And they sent me like to test it. And I, I, I absolutely love that thing. So this thing, if you haven't seen this again, it actually allows you either for your drums or anything to create 
the way you create the steps is that you could really like go and change like every step to subdivisions of third, fourth, like eight. And you can make for drums and rooms insane things, absolutely insane things. There was the keyboards of Dream Theater, like also like uh, showcasing that, which was like insane. And it's so easy to get some mad rhythms on bass and other things. So one thing I like to do is like literally take that and say now take MIDI from a interesting like kind of sequencer. So like let's say that. And okay, let's deactivate the sampler. So uh, okay, let's try that. So like let's say so you have this note, and I would say. So like I'd say, okay. I don't know if you can see how cool this is, but do you can you see what insane subdivisions you're doing in there? Because then you would have to actually divide that with your. If I want to do like uh, five notes, if I couldn't play them inside that space, I could do five notes and then obviously take them and you know try to get them in there and stuff. But uh, here I can actually subdivide any bits and change the time signatures and everything with just like one very simple click and then create some mad rhythms. I have my notes here. And just and let's do that, I don't know, on six. Might be too much. It was better before. <laughs> so like... Uh... divisions I can get with that and the mad rhythms that I can create with such ease to me I don't know if it's exciting to you when I saw that and I saw how easy it was like to get like all these insane subdivisions that's what I was thinking percussion bass lines like uh, all that because again I play guitar I play like a bit of bazooki I play keyboards not like to the, the level of the dream theater keyboard is not even to a good level I can play not many massive chops but um yeah, for me, having tools like that is uh, incredibly important. It helps like a lot to get like some complex sequences in there. And uh, the other insane thing with that is afterwards, when you do that, you can just like drag and drop it in there. And voila, there it is. So like, just like one click. This is called, by the way, guys, Beat Scholar. This thing is absolutely mad. And again, I've like, um, I think I'm using it for like, Chunks of stuff like now. I think it's just very interesting. Imagine like vocals, like scenes, bass, like the percussion, drums. It's, it's really cool. And the last thing I want to show you is that with all the software and the things that we see, sometimes very, very basic theoretically methods for me are very inspiring. For example, I have like uh, I, I, what I think and many other people consider to be one of the best three or three emulations for bass which is this guy here, the XO Xbox. And you know what? I could use it with media, I could do all that. However, the way I actually like to use it, and let me bring that in here. So like this channel 11, let's bring that in here so we can hear it. Um, and all I wanted to invite you to think with this is sometimes try some methods that are a bit unconventional. Already some methods that we see here are very unconventional. But try to think some methods are quite unconventional. So what do I consider an unconventional method here? Let's close all that. And let's hear this. So what I like to do is that I just get that thing like playing. And literally, for this, let's make it large. I go like to the pattern and I start recording with 
Recording rest. Recording rest. Sometimes I go and record the rests and the buttons in the sequencer because when I press rest, I can cut the notes like much shorter, a bit longer, like just the way I played it. And I get some of my favorite sequences like that, which might seem like a really, you know, unconventional uh, method to do it. But uh, you need to, I, I try always to find like ways that the machines and the things I have can be as expressive and I have a relationship with everything they do, like hands on. So yeah, explore like unconventional methods on uh, sequencing and like programming outside of all those conventional ways that we have seen. And uh, yes, that's all I wanted to show you today, guys. I hope like you found this uh, useful.